There we go. Amit. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Ah, so thank you very, thank you very much for the organizing, for giving me the opportunity to present this work here. What I want to talk about is uh, an unp unpublished work that uh, hopefully will soon be out. It's about uh, a new way of uh, computing four factors in the planar limit of n equal to four using uh, a similar operator product expansion, expansion around the collinear limit that uh, Georgius has talked about. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, Alexander Tumanov and Matthias uh, Wellham. Now, let me stress one thing, even though I'm giving the talk, uh, the person that did almost all the work that I will present is Alex, and he deserves almost all the credit on this work. He was working on this very hardly for the past two years, and I'm only <coughs> discovering the final result uh, today. So let me start by uh, a very short crash review of how we compute, uh, how we do the operator product expansion for amplitudes. Uh, luckily, George just described it, so I'll be very short. Sure. I'll assume that you heard it before and you heard it just in the previous talk. So I'll just focus on some main points that we then go and generalize for form factors. So um, maybe for that, let me explain what are form factors. So like this uh, poor B in the picture before, form factors is the probability for a local operator to create some set of asymptotic states. So in that regard, they stand somewhere in between scattering amplitudes and correlation functions. However, they naively, they naturally live in momentum space because the asymptotic particles live in momentum space. Now, uh, form factors in n equal to four have been studied extensively in the literature, both the quick and the strong coupling. I didn't try to cover here all the references. I, I refer you to a recent review by Young for a good reference. The nice thing about it is that we have a lot of data to explore and to try to understand the structure. So uh, our aim here would be to bootstrap only planar form factor at finite tooth coupling. And in this talk, I would only talk about what is called MHV form factors, which are the simplest one. They are the form factors for certain elicities of the stress tensor or the Lagrangian uh, multiplet in the planar limit of n equal to four. In the discussion, I'll mention uh, extension of that, but in this talk, I will only talk about the simplest possible form factor, also the one that we have most available data for, well, in perturbation theory. So going through that, now let's uh, do the review on uh, scattering amplitudes. Scattering amplitudes, uh, as George was uh, reviewing, in the planar limit, they are dual to polygon with a loop, where the edges of the polygon are the momentum of the external particle, and the polygon is closed because we have momentum conservation. In the explicit duality, we have to, stress, uh, to dress out a three-level MHV factor. And uh, the references were given in the previous talk. This was first obtained by using T-duality in strong coupling and then confirmed in perturbation theory. Now, uh, one way to uh, compute the polygon Wilson loops in uh, <laughs> planar limit of n equal to four is using what is called the operator product expansion. Here, for example, we have an octagon, and the way we compute it is an expansion around the multicollinear limit. Explicitly, what we do, we uh, tessellate it into a set of null squares. So here we have five null squares, three middle null squares. And we think about it as a sort of uh, partition function. We start here at the bottom with a GKP vacuum. We then propagate from the bottom flux to the first flux. We get some excited state, then to the next one, and eventually on the top, we end back with the vacuum. So explicitly, we write it as a sum of all excitation of the GKP flux to we saw the size here. Each one of them is to propagate some time momentum and some angle of phi. 
they are dual to the three symmetries of each of these middle uh, null square, and they describe the geometry of this polygon. They are conformal cross ratios. And each one of them is conjugate to GKP energy, momentum, and angular momentum that we know, thanks to Benjamin, at finite capital. Now, the new non trivial ingredients here are the Pentagon transitions. They describe the amplitude to go from one state in one flux to the other. And the main point to stress is that yeah, we know them at finite coupling, and therefore this is a way of expressing the amplitude in explicit form, the infinite sum at finite coupling. So our aim today would be to do something analogous, but instead for scattering amplitude for form factors, for the amplitude of local operator to create a set of asymptotic particles. So let's do that. The first step is again a duality with Wilson loop. Form factors, or explicitly form factors of the Lagrangian, are dual to periodic uh, Wilson loop. So here we have the set of <coughs> momentum that this Lagrangian creates. They are not sum to zero, and therefore after you sum over them, you don't get back to the same point. In order to compute them on the Wilson loop side, you have to consider a periodic Wilson loop. And you don't only have to consider a periodic Wilson loop, this periodicity is also applied at the quantum level, meaning at the diagrammatic level. This is something that uh, I described a bit in the last time I talked to IGST when we talk about non planar amplitudes. Luckily for us, we will not need too much the perturbative prescription of how to compute the <coughs> periodic Wilson loop in this talk. We will just use the available data for form factors. Uh, there is a generalization for, uh, same for amplitude for NMH3 form factor of any degree with, uh, with that are dual to supersymmetric uh, Wilson loop with the super periodicity that I would not talk, describe in this talk. Um, the duality as for amplitude has not been proven and uh, we will use it as a working uh, assumption and the fact that we will match with data can be thought of as another support of this duality beyond leading order. Um, here you see the, for the Lagrangian, we have just periodic Wilson loop. The natural question when you see that is to ask, okay, what is the dual of other operator, of a general operator? This is something that we have not studied at all but the natural expectation it that is will be dual to uh, a period again a periodic Wilson loop but with a modified periodicity constraint here the periodicity constraint come because the operator carry momentum other operator carry additional charges and they will come with a modified periodicity constraint this is an expectation that has not been checked how do we now uh, develop an OP expansion for such a periodic Wilson loop. So here is, uh, again, a picture of a periodic Wilson loop made of uh, five, one, two, three, four, five particles. Q is the total momentum of the operator. As before, the first step is to divide it, to tessellate it into a set of null squares. Every such null, a line is a null line that go out of the cusp and intersect the edge on the other side. So we think as before, we start here from the vacuum, we go for a pentagon transition and we create a flux to excitation. This part is just the same as it was before. It doesn't know about the periodicity constraint. The new ingredients only come here at the end when we get to the last uh, flux to with the state psi three here. And this one is being overlapped with the periodic periodicity of the Wilson. And this is the new ingredient of the, of the form factors. In equations, we have an analog partition function like sum of GKP excitations. We start here again with a vacuum, go for a set of pentagon transition. This part here again is exactly the same as before. The only new ingredients is the last step, the probability for the periodic Wilson loop to absorb the flux to state psi free. Just to do maybe an analogy with the correlation function, 
the energy of the GKP excitation are analog to dimension of local operators when you do OP. The pentagon transition are the analog of the structure constants, so the three-point function. What is the analog of these new ingredients, which we call the form factor transition? You can think about it as a defect one-point function, like the overlap of some certain state or certain operator with a certain boundary. So the, it will be the main star of the rest of the talk. Let me just uh, talk a bit about kinematics, um, about the geometry. So the simplest form factor is a form factor for two particles in yellow here. Such a periodic polygon is no conformal cross ratios. It's a bit analog of the Pentagon. It kind of have minus one conformal cross ratios. We use it as the background, what you boost up is the form factor with more than two particles. The first non-trivial one, which is a bit the analog of the hexagon, is the three particle form factor. This form factor has only two independent conformal cross ratios, which are tau and sigma, if you call it the OPE. It's angle uh, phi, the analog one that Georgius was taking to infinity in the previous uh, talk is zero. And the reason here is that we are just having one more cusp one more point that is pointing out of the plane of the uh, square. This is the reference square. And there is no two pointers, so there is no angle in between. Above that, the moment we add another particle, another edge, we add another three conformal cross ratios. So in general, an n particle form factor of three n minus seven independent conformal cross ratios. So only this sum in the, for the, for the uh, <coughs> third, channel, I have to set phi to zero. So the main point of this slide is therefore is that in order now to compute form factors of any number of particles, all we need is one new universal ingredient, which is the probability of the periodic Wilson loop to absorb a certain GKT excitation. This is what we call it F, F of psi. Okay. From now on, I will focus on it. What it described. So um, to describe it more uh, properly, we have to talk about what exactly are these uh, GKP excitations. One thing before that, I uh, assumed that we have here a conformal symmetry, dual conformal symmetry, actually. We talk about conformal cross ratios. For the normal uh, planar amplitudes and the way one remove the conformal anomaly and talk about finite conformal invariant quantity is by taking a ratio. This is one way. We take a ratio of, uh, this is a, a seven point amplitude, multiply by all the middle square and dividing by all the pentagons. This is basically dividing by the background and only consider the contribution of the excitation on top of it. When you talk about now a periodic Wilson loop, we do exactly the same. We multiply by the middle squares, we divide by the pentagons because this part doesn't know about the periodicity, but here in the last step, we have to divide by the kind of a periodic square, the two point form factor. The point is that this ratio is both finite and dual conformal invariant. And when checking that, one has to be careful and know that here, when we talk about conformal symmetry, the conformal symmetry also acts on the periodicity constraint, okay? not just on the moment, on the points, on the moment. That said, so here I'll focus on this ratio. Okay? To describe the form factor transition, we have to first talk about function of what it is. It's function of the GKP excitation, and how we describe them, because the energy of the GKP excitation is gapped, we can describe it by a set of excitations. And this excitation can have momentum or rapidity along the flux, and they can have flavor. They can be scalars, fermions, or gauge fields, or bound of gauge fields. So uh, a form factor transition is the amplitude for a set of n such GKP excitation to be absorbed by the periodic Wilson. Now we'll come something very troubling. The form factor transition 
is uh, new, is all live in the plane of the square. So it's neutral under rotation in the two dimensions that are transverse to the land square. It also doesn't carry any internal symmetry. Therefore, the, it can only absorb states that are singlet. They don't carry any one of these charges. Okay. You can only have non-zero form factor with size as a singlet. It means that the number of excitation, because all the excitations carry one of these, at least one of these charges, this only starts at two particles. This complicated life a lot. The form factor is therefore very, very hard to check. It starts only with the two particle singlet. From among the two particle state, the two particle singlet is the most complicated one. It was not constructed before. It is the generate. There are a perturbation theory, there are three type of singlet state, all with the same energy. And moreover, the geometry, the direction sigma, only couples to the center of mass of the two excitation. This is something that it's much, much harder than what we had before for the um, amplitudes. Something that you can get to work or not to work. Once it doesn't work, there are so many things to play with that it's really hard to fix. I wouldn't have given this talk if this wouldn't work. And this is why it also took so long. This project took about two years to complete. Uh, <clears throat> let me now, uh, before going to the how we look in perturbation theory and the check, we first discussed the non-perturbative properties of this new object that we call the form factor transition. So uh, first we have the Watson axiom, mainly that if you interchange two particles, you pay the S metric. Not of the form. But square limit. If we take particle one here to the left and the last particle n to the right, they decouple from the rest of the particle and look like they propagate just on the square. As opposed to the, we read something very similar for the pentagons, but as opposed to the pentagons, this can now happen in two different directions. Particle one can go to the left or particle one can go to the right, playing the S matrices with all the particles in between, and then another square limit with the last particle on the other side. Therefore, in the limit where the momentum or the rapidity of particle one and particle n coincide, or any two particles, the form factor must have a pole. The residue of the pole is the square transition, or what we call the inverse measure. And there are two such <laughs> poles. In between them, there is the S matrix between the two excitations that on the pole have the same rapidity. So this S matrix is plus or minus one, depends on the type of the excitation. And here we have plus or minus one, and it depends on if it's a boson or fermion. As a result, for gluons and fermions, we get a delta function. We get yeah, in total a minus sign. Just to get the delta function when any two rapidities uh, coincide, and the residue is the square transition, is the inverse measure. For scalars, we have a principal part uh, prescription because the total sign is plus. Second, we have a reflection symmetry. This is just a geometrical uh, symmetry of the periodic Wilson loop. Imagine that you look on it from the other side. The most non-trivial uh, property, what we call the mirror axiom, is what happens when you take one of the particle and do two mirror transformation. Mirror transformation have the effect of moving it to the next edge. If we do two of these, it goes from this edge to this edge, which is the same image of the same edge for in the other copy. So when you do two mirror transformation, we get back the form factor transition, but where the first particle become the last. Okay. This is the most non-trivial and non-perturbative property that we expect this form factor to uh, satisfy. Let me just mention that all of these properties are uh, <coughs> satisfied by a factorized uh, ansatz. So what we expect is that the non-perturbative uh, form factor will take this form of a factorized product. And all we really care about is the two particle form factor. 
So I'm done with the non-protubative properties that we now go to a perturbation theory to what happened when we check this structure in perturbation theory. So uh, <coughs> two particles have energy two, okay? So the first, part, the first contribution in this collinear limit comes from the two particle symbol. Okay? So this is, uh, this state was not constructed before. Let me describe it in a few words. We managed to construct it. Uh, there are actually uh, three types of two particle singlets. Ones that have two asymptotic gluons, two asymptotic fermions, or two asymptotic gauge fields. However, because it's a singlet, each one of them contains all the fields. Even the particle that contain asymptotically only two gluons, it also contains two scalars and two fermions, only they are not survived asymptotically when you separate them a lot. Really mix all the excitation for any of these. So here, this is the state, and what are this u1 and u2 are the momentum or rapidities of the two excitation, and sigma one and sigma two are the positions of the insertions on the periodic Wilson. Okay, so here, for example, you can have a gauge field and it's conjugate. And each one of them have support on two fermions, two scalars, and two ones. So this is why these states are much more complicated than the one that are made of two identical particles. They don't involve such a mix. Okay. What we have to do now to compute this form factor transition at, at bone level, at leading order, is to take this state we have constructed and overlap it with the periodic velocity. And what it means to overlap, let's say we have here sca two scalars, scalars which conjugate with the periodic velocity. At leading order, it just means to draw a free propagator between the excitation and the image of the other one in the next channel, in the next, uh, sorry, in the next copy of the periodic person. So here is the propagator, and in the sigma variables, it takes this form. So this is uh, almost identical to the Pentagon transition at three level. The only difference is this factor of two. This S here is the conformal spin, one half for scalar, uh, one for fermion and three halves for gluons. So once this is done, now we have to integrate over the position to get really the form factor transition that is only function of the two rapidities, the two momentum. And this is the result, we're going to present the result that we have found. Every piece in this result is highly non-trivial. Not that in order to compute the ratio, at least in order, one just have to compute to integrate gluon propagators on the periodic prism. However, once you uh, do this uh, decomposition, you see that everything contributes. The contribution of the gluons, of the fermions, and the scalars. Nothing is zero. So this is the result we found. The form factor transition for the gauge field and the fermions are only have the square limit delta function. This is the square limit delta function, and this is the inverse measure at leading order in perturbation theory. Other than that, there is nothing there. Even though that any piece of the computation, the contribution of the two scalar, the two gluons, or the two fermion part is highly non-trivial, they manage together to cancel out, and you just remain with the delta function. And surprisingly, the only non-trivial part is the scalar. Even though in perturbation theory, it comes just from drawing a gluon propagator and integrated over the Wilson loop, the only non-trivial part from the form factor transition is the scalar one. Now we put it back together in the OP sum and perform the integration, and this is the function that we found. Okay. Again, this is the function that has energy two, here e to the minus two tau, coming from the two particles, and there are, of course, higher loop, higher uh, <coughs> correction coming from more heavier states which carry more particles. This is the leading one coming from the two particle singlet. This is from the OP side. Let me now describe the data. The data we consider this uh, ratio. So now we have a free particle form factor. We consider this finite conformal invariant ratio and we parameterize it in terms of the OP to OP conformal cost ratio, which are tau and sigma. And this is the result we found, some combination of lead tools. And once you now expand this at large tau, you find a precise match. Okay. So this was, this is really something that 
really hard if it doesn't work. You don't know almost where to play with because it's the sum of many, many contribution of two particles where the result only coupled to the center of mass, the sigma recall only coupled to the center of mass of the two excitation. The relative position was integrated and these are complicated functions. We can now in the position to give prediction for higher loops. For example, at two loops, the result now have a new term, which is a term that is linear in tau. It comes from a one loop correction to the energy of these particles. In the OPE to compute it, all you have to do is to insert the sum of the energies of these two excitations. So when we do that, this is the function we found for B of sigma, the term linear in tau at two loops. We then went and analyzed the data and it's much precisely. So on this match, we can now have uh, infinitely many prediction at any loop order. For example, at three loops, there will be a term that go like tau square. And this is the prediction for what one should find, but it has not been computed yet. Okay. I see my time's up. So uh, let me summarize. Uh, <laughs> this is a future direction. So what we are basically trying to do now is to solve this non-perturbative uh, set of axiom. This is <laughs> together with Benjamin Basel and try to find the finite coupling expression for this form factor transition. So far, we listed the property that they have to satisfy and we check that this structure indeed hold in perturbation theory. We didn't, uh, one can analyze the same thing at strong coupling. This is not done yet. One can generalize all the structure for charged form factor transition and NMHV uh, <coughs> form factor. One can consider other operator with, I expect, more uh, intrinsic uh, periodicity constraint. And uh, as you know, in general local operators, the best way to compute their properties or wave function and spectrum is the quantum spectral curve. And it would be nice to make connection between the form factor transition and the quantum spectral curve, it's a bit like the overlap of the GKP state and a local operator. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Let's thank uh, Amit. Okay. And uh, now we have time for questions. Please raise your hand and mute yourself or send a I, Can I ask one? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I have some construction nearby. Hope you can hear me. Uh, can you consider uh, an operator with one unit of charge and then have one particle instead of Lagrangian? Isn't there someone in the same multiplet but just with one unit that would help you? Uh, no. Uh, make progress in this direction. It doesn't seem to uh, to help you in terms of absorbing one particle. More questions? Are there more questions? No, I don't see any. No, I have uh, one more. Can, okay, you read off, can you read off the F at strong coupling from uh, the Y system of Juan and uh, Sasha? Yeah, yes, you should be able to do. This is not done. The way the Y system currently is written at strong coupling is in the parametric form. So you first have to bring it to the geometric form and then just expand. I see. Okay, last call for questions. More? All right, mm -hmm. if there are no more questions, is somebody, no? Uh, I, I don't know how to raise my hands. I can do this visually. Uh, oh, oh yeah, hi, just ask, yeah, unmute yourself and ask, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. uh, so, um, uh, I mean, if you if you have just um, uh, uh, in the strong complete limit, if you have a polygon Wilson loop, 
that describes your uh, form factor. Uh, but uh, the operator is just uh, a marked point on the surface. So you differentiate with respect to the... Uh, no, this is already the, the T-dual picture. So the uh -huh. operator started as a marked point. After T-duality, it, it was in momentum space. So it was pointed inject momentum. After you T-dualize it, it inject extension. Which is yes, that's true. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I was thinking about uh, an operator which corresponds to the puncture operator in quantum gravity, which just pins a point and has uh, zero quantum numbers. So does it correspond to uh, some form factor in your description? So this is really a, a question not about this type of form factor that they talked about. Yeah, it's more general. <laughs> yes, because the, the, <laughs> the flux is zero. It sounds that by definition, yes. That if you consider a polygon with an add to it, uh, such a, a puncture, this is a definition. Question is, what can you say about it? Uh, the point here is that this form factor satisfies a very nice and simple, uh, relatively simple axioms that are not too hard to find a solution. The problem is more to find a solution that match the data to the point. So. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a last question from Lance Dixon. Hi, Amit, nice talk. Hey, thank you. I couldn't you. quite tell, do you predict more than the leading log in, in tau at the moment, or does that have to wait? No. That have to wait for uh, to do to go. The next step is to try to uh, solve for this form factor transition and find a couple. So and you to find just have the, you have the the leading coupling piece of yeah, it. Yeah, right at now. the moment it's just the leading coupling. Yeah, the leading log. And so uh, this is sort of Pedro's question too. But so by considering generic operators with generic charges, uh, if you had the data for that. Would that help? There is, uh, this is something we tried a lot. We have the data. It doesn't seem to help. Okay. It's I mean, as complicated as it. Thank you. Okay. More questions? I don't see anybody. Uh, let's see. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Amit again.